Fiction has imagined humanity's end in many ways. Nuclear war, AI uprising, alien invasion. But The Last of Us chose something far simpler and more terrifying. A fungus. Not just any fungus either. Cordyceps, a real-world parasite that already dominates the minds of insects. In the world of The Last of Us, a mutated strain of cordyceps jumps to humans, sparking a global collapse. Cities fall, governments fracture, and the infected, neither living nor dead, roam the ruins. The brilliance of this story isn't just its horror, it's the biological plausibility underneath it. Fungal infections are a real, rising threat, and cordyceps, while currently limited to insects, follows mechanisms that scientists have studied in alarming detail. Today, we'll trace the real-world biology behind the infection. We'll start by understanding what cordyceps actually does in nature, how it infiltrates, manipulates, and consumes its hosts. Then, we'll step into the terrifying possibilities. What changes would need to happen for this parasite to survive in humans? How realistic are the stages of infection depicted in the game? And how close, if at all, is the modern world to facing a fungal threat we're not prepared to stop? The science behind The Last of Us isn't pure fantasy. Parts of it, chillingly, are already happening. In reality, over 400 species of cordyceps fungi exist, each one specialising in parasitising a specific type of insect or arthropod. The most infamous is Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, the so-called zombie ant fungus, first described in 1865. The infection begins when fungal spores land on the body of an insect, typically a carpenter ant. The spores penetrate the exoskeleton and begin to grow inside the host. Instead of killing immediately, the fungus spreads quietly, weaving itself through muscle fibres and around vital organs. What follows is a slow, horrifying hijacking of the ant's nervous system. Once established, cordyceps manipulates the ant's behaviour with precision. Infected ants abandon their colonies and climb to elevated areas, typically a leaf or branch about 25 centimetres off the forest floor, an ideal environment for fungal growth. The ant is then compelled to bite down in a death grip, anchoring itself in place. After death, the fungus consumes the remaining soft tissue and sprouts a stalk from the back of the ant's head, releasing spores to infect others. This life cycle is ruthlessly efficient. Infect, control, kill, reproduce. It doesn't just destroy its host, it turns it into a delivery system for the next infection. However, there are biological limits. Cordyceps species are highly specialised. O. unilateralis can only infect certain ants. Their enzymes and infection methods are tailored to specific exoskeletons, specific immune systems, and specific environmental conditions. Most notably, cordyceps struggles outside humid tropical environments and cannot survive the higher body temperatures of mammals. Insects have body temperatures that fluctuate with their surroundings, often far cooler than humans. Cordyceps thrives at around 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, while the average human body sits at 37 degrees Celsius. For the fungus to infect humans, it would need major evolutionary changes, not just in temperature tolerance, but in its method of host interaction, immune evasion, and growth patterns. Despite these limitations, recent studies in mycology show fungi are adapting. Species like Candida auris, a deadly fungal infection in hospitals, have evolved to survive warmer temperatures. Climate change, by increasing global temperatures, is accelerating fungal adaptation. Fungi that once could not survive in human bodies are getting closer to bridging that gap. Cordyceps, for now, is a threat limited to insects. But evolution, given the right pressures and enough time, has a way of finding new paths. Now, this has all been very grounded and scientific so far, but let's be real. This is a gaming lore channel, so I'm basically required by law to dive into the infected themselves for a bit. Let's break down the different stages of infection and see just how far Cordyceps takes things when it's let loose on humanity. The Last of Us organises infection into distinct stages, 
each showcasing the fungus's escalating control over the host's body and mind. These stages aren't just for storytelling. They reflect biological principles of parasitic invasion, tissue restructuring, and environmental adaptation. Layered with subtle in-game lore, they present a terrifyingly coherent infection cycle. Runners are the first stage, typically appearing one to two days after infection. Hosts still look mostly human, with minor fungal intrusion visible under the skin and around the eyes and mouth. However, their behaviour is radically altered. They are hyper-aggressive, disoriented, and driven by an overwhelming urge to attack and spread the infection. Runners tend to move in erratic, twitchy patterns, lunging unpredictably at prey. Some runners sob or scream, a chilling indication that traces of human consciousness may still exist, trapped beneath fungal domination. In groups, runners often behave in semi-coordinated packs, overwhelming targets with sheer numbers. Environmental factors influence their behaviour. In confined spaces, they display frantic, chaotic attacks, while in open areas, they sometimes hesitate or roam aimlessly, suggesting incomplete neurological override early in infection. Their vulnerability lies in their relatively intact human anatomy. They can still be killed with conventional injuries like gunshots or blunt force trauma, particularly targeting vital organs or the brain. Stalkers emerge a few days to several weeks into infection. Their name reflects their tactics, using stealth, patience and sudden ambushes to hunt. Unlike the frenzied runners, stalkers will hide behind cover, circle prey and attack when targets are isolated or vulnerable. Physically, fungal growth becomes externally visible. Patches of hardened fungal plating rupture through the skin, especially around the head, shoulders and spine. Their eyesight is partially compromised, but not fully lost, leading to a hunting strategy that blends short bursts of speed with careful tracking. In wetter or darker environments, stalkers thrive, utilising shadows and debris to mask their movements. Their semi-patient behaviour hints that some midbrain functions related to hunting and predatory instinct have been preserved or even enhanced by fungal manipulation. Killing a stalker is harder than a runner. Their fungal growth offers partial armour, deflecting glancing blows. Precision targeting, preferably headshots or strikes to expose tissue, becomes necessary to neutralise them. Clickers represent the most iconic and terrifying form of the infected. Typically developing over the course of a year, clickers have completely lost their sight as thick fungal plates engulf the head and eyes. What they lose in vision, they gain in echolocation. By emitting rapid clicking sounds and interpreting the echoes, clickers navigate their surroundings with eerie precision. In close quarters, they are brutally efficient hunters, able to locate even slight movements or muffled sounds. Clickers' physical resilience is notable. Fungal armour becomes dense and woody, capable of absorbing minor impacts and making them impervious to weak attacks. Their hands often morph into claw-like structures, hardened fungal growths replacing or reinforcing bone and tissue, enabling devastating melee strikes. Clickers are highly sensitive to noise. Small sounds, footsteps, coughing, bumping into debris, immediately draw their attention. Conversely, they are almost blind to slow, deliberate movements in silence, allowing skilled survivors to evade them entirely. Environmental conditions subtly influence clickers. In humid areas, their fungal growth appears denser and more spread across the body, whereas drier regions result in more brittle armour plating. Bloaters and shamblers are the final evolutionary phases of infected, typically after many years of unchecked fungal growth. Bloaters are massive, slow-moving creatures covered in layers of tough fungal armour. Their bodies have expanded grotesquely, the fungus swelling through muscle, fat and connective tissues. Bloaters are immensely strong, capable of ripping humans apart barehanded. They can also tear fungal plates from their own bodies and hurl them as makeshift explosive projectiles, releasing clouds of infectious spores upon impact. Bloaters are rare, but highly territorial. In-game lore suggests they prefer isolated, damp environments, sewer tunnels, abandoned basements and underground bunkers, where spore concentrations are naturally higher. Their slow movement is offset by brute resilience. 
they can withstand extreme punishment before dying, requiring concentrated firepower or explosive force to bring down. Physical vulnerabilities remain, but they are few. Exposed areas around joints, under the fungal plates, and soft tissue regions like the mouth or gut. Shamblers are a variant adapted for extremely wet environments. Unlike bloaters, shamblers cannot throw projectiles, but instead release corrosive bursts of spore-laden acid when damaged or killed. Their body chemistry appears different, tuned for dispersing spores quickly in damp air. Shamblers are less heavily armoured than bloaters, but compensate with explosive, area-of-effect attacks that punish proximity. Their habitat choices, flooded subway tunnels, marshy ruins, or abandoned ports, reflect real fungal tendencies to favour moisture for reproductive success. Fighting a shambler often requires distance tactics, engaging too closely risks inhalation of spores or severe acid burns. The Rat King, featured in The Last of Us Part 2, is an extreme outlier but biologically plausible within the game's rules. Formed from multiple infected fusing together inside an abandoned hospital basement over decades, it represents complete fungal integration. The mass exhibits combined characteristics of bloaters, clickers and stalkers, capable of separating pieces of itself as autonomous threats. While this fusion is dramatised, the underlying concept that a fungus could cause hosts to grow together through relentless hyphal spread aligns with how real fungi merge and colonise available biomass when unchecked. Throughout every stage, The Last of Us shows that environmental conditions, humidity, temperature, terrain, subtly shape fungal evolution. Moisture promotes growth and acid production in shamblers, dryness hardens armour in bloaters, and darkness enhances stealth behaviours with stalkers. Each infected type maintains a brutal biological purpose. Runners spread infection rapidly through direct assault. Stalkers ambush isolated targets, spreading spores from secluded locations. Clickers apex predators using sensory compensation to hunt persistently. Bloaters durable spore factories, securing fungal dominance over long periods. Rat King an evolutionary dead end, but a monument to fungal survival at any cost. While the infection timeline is accelerated for narrative tension, the structure, initial infection, behavioural alteration, tissue takeover, reproductive priority, is hauntingly methodical, grounded in real parasitic logic. It's not death that defines the infected, it's survival for the fungus. For cordyceps to infect humans as depicted in The Last of Us, it would require several major evolutionary leaps, each one unlikely, but not impossible. First, the fungus would need to overcome the thermal barrier. Human bodies maintain a steady internal temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius, significantly higher than the conditions cordyceps evolved for. To survive, it would need adaptations similar to thermotolerant fungi like Candida auris, which has already emerged in real hospitals as a persistent heat-resistant pathogen. Climate change is steadily pushing fungal species toward higher temperature tolerance. Under enough environmental pressure, a future strain of cordyceps could theoretically adapt as well. Second, the method of infection would have to change. In ants, cordyceps spores penetrate through the relatively thin chitinous exoskeleton. Humans, however, have thicker, more complex skin barriers and an advanced immune system designed to detect and destroy fungal invaders. For a human infecting cordyceps to exist, it would need to evolve enzymes capable of breaking down human tissue defences or find alternate points of entry, such as through inhalation of spores, which is precisely how infection begins in The Last of Us. Third, there's the issue of neurological control. Cordyceps doesn't directly think for its host. It manipulates behaviour through chemical signalling and muscle control, not by reprogramming the brain. To hijack a human's complex nervous system, a mutated cordyceps would need far more sophisticated mechanisms, perhaps producing neurotoxins or neurotransmitter mimicking chemicals to influence behaviour without fully shutting down higher cognitive functions. In the game's world, infected individuals pass through distinct stages. Runners, stalkers, clickers and bloaters. 
each representing a deeper level of fungal integration. Biologically, this mirrors the progressive growth of fungal tissue inside a living host, overwhelming and replacing bodily systems over time. Finally, there's transmission. Natural cordyceps spreads when spores are physically released into the air after the death of the host. In The Last of Us, the mutated fungus is airborne, capable of infecting nearby humans without direct physical contact. For this to occur, a cordyceps variant would need to produce highly resilient, easily aerosolized spores, resistant enough to survive in varied environments, similar to real fungal spores like those of Aspergillus or Histoplasma, which can persist in the air and infect human lungs. In short, while the leap from insect parasite to human pandemic would require extreme and unlikely changes, none of the steps are purely science fiction. Each adaptation, heat resistance, airborne transmission, immune evasion, neurological interference, already exists in separate fungal species today. The Last of Us simply imagines a future where they all converge into one perfect predator. While The Last of Us takes creative liberties, the infection's basic concept stays surprisingly close to real-world fungal behaviour, up to a point. First, the idea of behavioural manipulation by a parasite is fully grounded in biology. Cordyceps, liver flukes, rabies, and even Toxoplasma gondii alter host behaviour to enhance their spread. Insects controlled by cordyceps show compulsive climbing and biting, behaviours that increase the fungus's ability to reproduce. In mammals, rabies causes aggression and hypersalivation, helping the virus spread through bites. A fungus evolving to subtly alter human behaviour through chemical interference or nerve damage is biologically possible, though the complexity of human brains would make it vastly harder than in insects. Second, spore-based infection is a real threat today. Fungal spores like those from Aspergillus and Coccidioids can survive in the air, remain infectious for long periods, and cause respiratory infections when inhaled. While most spores are harmless to healthy humans, rising rates of fungal disease in immunocompromised patients show that fungi can be serious pathogens, especially in environments with weakened infrastructure, poor sanitation, or climate change-induced pressures. The depiction of airborne infection via fungal spores in the game while dramatised, reflects a genuine pathway fungi already exploit. However, some elements stretch biology. The echolocation ability of clickers, for instance, while fascinating, assumes rapid neural rewiring and adaptation that would normally take generations to evolve. In real life, echolocation in blind humans develops with training over months or years, not spontaneously due to brain damage. Similarly, the extreme physical mutations seen in bloaters would require the fungus not only to grow through human tissue, but also to somehow restructure bones and muscles for superhuman strength, which goes beyond known fungal capabilities. The speed of transformation is another major leap. Insects infected by cordyceps take days to weeks to fully succumb. For humans, a fungal parasite would likely take much longer to cause profound changes, months or even years unless the infection was extraordinarily aggressive and well adapted. Finally, temperature tolerance remains the biggest biological barrier. Human body heat is an effective defence against most fungi. While some fungal species are evolving higher heat tolerances, a cordyceps strain capable of thriving in humans would require a full re-engineering of its metabolism, a process that, under natural conditions, could take thousands of years unless artificially accelerated. The Last of Us stitches together real biological phenomena, parasitic mind control, spore-based infection, tissue invasion, and pushes them to their narrative extremes. While the full scenario remains science fiction, the individual building blocks are disturbingly plausible, and modern trends suggest that humanity's long-standing safety from fungal threats may not be as permanent as once thought. If you enjoyed this breakdown of the infected from The Last of Us, consider becoming a channel member to support more deep dives like this. You'll get perks, behind the scenes content, and help keep the channel going. And you can always help out the channel by subscribing and hitting that like button. Thanks for your support and hope to see you in the next video.